presentation on the spring uh, series of spe guest speakers and the uh, UCD Fos4G lab. Uh, again, welcome to those of you that are here in the room as well as those that are joining us remotely. And today, as you know, we will have the presentation by Kerry Googler, and she is the senior manager of monitoring and evaluation of the organization called Water for People. And the presentation is about achieving impact in the water and sanitation sectors with AKVO flow monitoring platform. And I have asked Kerry to um, provide us with a little bit of information about her background so that we know what she has done and her uh, formation. So please don't be shy about it. And uh, welcome and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Um, my name is Carrie Kugler, and I'm going to go ahead and get the slideshow started. I apologize, I've got a little bit of a cold, so I'll try to be as loud as I can. <clears throat> oh, that's a weird display about that there. Hold on. There, oh. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. And let me try this thing. I think that's. Did we start the sharing? Yeah, Let me show you what we have. Uh, we're trying to share the desktop so everybody can see the slides. Just a moment. Uh, here we are. Share the screen. Share the whole thing. So is it, can, it, can you see it? All right, perfect. So now we can go into the presentation and we should be okay. So my name is Carrie Kugler. I work for an organization called Water for People. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've got my background. I've got an undergraduate degree in anthropology from Fort Lewis College down in uh, southern Colorado in Durango. Um, after that, I worked on a PhD uh, at Georgia State University in biology, which I actually left, so I don't have uh, that degree, but I started on that process before I decided that wasn't for me. There I was actually working with um, language using bonobo chimpanzees, so totally different tract uh, than, than where I ended up. After that, I came back to Colorado, wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life, um, and took the certificate for nonprofit administration here at, over at Metro. Um, and uh, spent I've spent uh, the last 12 or so years working in the nonprofit sector here in Colorado. I started out doing fundraising, um, but very quickly missed my kind of research roots from when I was doing anthropology and biology. And so uh, seven years ago, I joined the organization Water for People um, and started working with them to develop their monitoring and evaluation program. And that really let me kind of synthesize my skills um, in research. I have some background with database administration um, and, and building databases. Um, and it let me kind of pull a lot of what I've done in the past together um, and work for an international organization that um, helps people achieve clean water and sanitation in the, in the developing world. So that's a little bit of background on me. Uh, a little bit of background on Water for People. Um, Water for People's uh, international NGO that's based here in Colorado. Our headquarters are, are here in Denver. We've got about 35 people that work for us here in Denver. Uh, and we've got about 150 people that work for us globally in nine countries. It says 140 there. I think we're up, up to about 150 now. Um, we work in nine countries <coughs> throughout the um, world. We work in uh, Africa, India, Central and South America. Um, we're about a $15 million organization. And um, this year we're looking to raise that to about a $17 million organization. 
we have the essential mission to help people get uh, sustainable water and sanitation um, to everybody in the areas where we work forever. It's kind of a different mission than most organizations because uh, many water and sanitation organizations focus on those that are easy to reach. And one of the things that distinguishes us from others is that we have a commitment to reach everyone in our target areas. Uh, and that means the poorest of the poor, the hardest to reach, the disabled, the people who are most remote. Um, we have a commitment to, achieve, to reaching everybody in the areas that we work. So to that end, we have to do a really good job of collecting a lot of information about the people in the places where we work, about their uh, level of access to water and sanitation, and we have to continuously monitor that over time and monitor our interventions to see if they're working or if they're not working so that we can course correct. So how did we do that? Well, when I joined the organization uh, in 2006, we did that the way that most organizations do that, um, which was to send volunteers into the field with a GPS unit, a camera, some uh, pieces of paper to collect information, clipboards, <clears throat> and they'd take that all out into the field uh, and collect some information. They'd collect information all day under very hard circumstances, and then at night they would come back to their, to the, uh, our field offices and they would type that all into Excel, um, usually until about 2 a.m. and uh, after a couple of beers, and uh, so the error rate was very high. <laughs> And then they would send those Excel spreadsheets back to me in Denver. <clears throat> and uh, then somebody would get the fun job of muling giant stacks of paper um, back to Denver so that we'd have the primary data. At which point I would get the fun job of going through all of that information and finding the transcription errors, the um, logical errors, the places where people failed to follow skip patterns, the places where the photos didn't actually match up with the correct surveys, the places where the GPS coordinates put, put things in the middle of the ocean because they didn't calibrate their GPS units. Um, and I get to find all of these, these errors and then go through this giant stacks of paper which surrounded my desk and see if I could figure out if I could figure out the issues, if I could read the handwriting, if I could fix any of it, if we had to throw it out. We didn't have, we couldn't afford any um, licensing for any really good um, GIS software, so we relied on volunteers who worked in um, the water and sanitation sector here in, in, in North America, who did have access to that software to put this information into maps for us, but they're volunteers, so they're busy people, so sometimes that would take four to six months. We'd run all the data through SPSS, <clears throat> do some analysis on it, and by the time we had any sort of analysis and maps created, um, four to six months had gone by. And really, by that point, the data wasn't particularly useful to the field anymore. So in 2009, um, our CEO and I and, and a software developer and I, that we knew got together, and we decided that there had to be a better way of doing things. And so we started to build uh, this application and this, this um, platform called what's now called Actful Flow. And what it was initially was a way to collect data very quickly, um, which was geospatially located, which could take pictures, um, and all using an Android phone, that then transmitted that data up into a cloud-based uh, database and uh, dashboard where our field staff could instantly access the data or within about 10 minutes of it you know, hitting the servers, so near real time, and where that information would be put instantly onto a map. And uh, we had the vision of sharing this with the sector, so we decided we wanted to make it open source. And we thought, oh, maybe one or two other organizations out there might want to use it. Um, so we started building it in 2009. We built very quickly. Um, we started building it in August of 2009, and we started deploying it in May of 2010. And uh, um, our CEO gave a talk about it uh, at uh, South by Southwest in 2010, thinking maybe one or two other organizations might have some interest in it. And about 300 other organizations called us within a week and wanted to use it. And we found ourselves faced with a really big problem because we had one software developer, me, 
Um, and that was about it. And we had no way of provisioning it to 300 organizations. We had no way of training 300 organizations. We had no way of hosting data for 300 organizations. So we found ourselves in kind of a tricky situation. So in 2012, we decided we had to do one of two things. We either had to uh, build out a business unit that was gonna do nothing but build the software, further develop it, provision it to other people, train other organizations, or we had to find somebody who could do that for us. And we decided really our expertise wasn't in software development, so we did an RFP process to find a new home for Flow. And we looked around, as we actually um, bid on buying the product, we decided not to go with them because we wanted the product to be open source. Um, and we uh, ended up partnering with this Dutch organization called ACVO. And if you're wondering what ACVO means, it's, it's an Esperanto word for water. They're a Dutch organization that is, their mission is to provide technology solutions to the international development community. And they had other um, products. They're an open data um, organization. They're an open source organization. And so they were a really good fit for us. And so in 2012, we actually transferred Flow to ACVO. And so Water for People no longer owns Flow, owns Flow. Um, uh, and it was fully open sourced at that time, hosted on GitHub. And ACVO um, has taken it and has done all of the, the feature development since that point. And we sit on an advisory council for them with them. So what is Flow? Flow is a multi-language tool for collecting and evaluating and displaying um, georeferenced data using Android smartphones. So um, very simply, it's got a few different components. One is that it's, uh, it's something you can put on any Android smartphone, an application that lets you collect lots of different types of information. You can collect GPS units, you can collect photos, you can write surveys. They're completely um, agnostic. Um, you can write surveys on any topic. It doesn't have to be about water and sanitation. Um, you can collect information in just about any language. Um, and uh, then there's a, a map component where the information is put onto online maps. Um, and there's a dashboard that runs some very simple reporting and where all of the information is stored. The idea was for it to be something that was very simple to use. We didn't want anything complicated. We wanted something that any field staff anywhere in the world could use to create a survey on anything they wanted to, collect information, and use it to make programmatic decisions very quickly. So uh, Flow is fully open sourced. Um, it's posted on GitHub, and there is an active community that works to uh, um, contribute to feature development. Uh, it's under an AGPL license, and so that means that uh, anybody can take it and use it, but if you make any changes or um, additions to the code, you do have to contribute those back to the main source code repository so that those uh, feature developments can benefit anybody who is using the tool. So what is Flow? Flow is a few different pieces. There's a dashboard, which is a cloud-based system. Um, we can give access to any number of users anywhere in the world. We can do it in uh, English, French, uh, Spanish, and Hindi at this point. And uh, they can create surveys. They can assign those surveys to phones. They can run data reports. They can see maps. And they can manage users. We can do some fine-grained roles and permissions so that we can, say, give uh, governments access to view data, um, but not change data, and uh, can create um, any surveys on any anything we want to. The next piece is the phones. Um, on the phones, we can collect all different kinds of information. Um, we can have surveys that can have free text questions, options, cascading questions, which allow us to upload complicated uh, geo. Um, georeferenced information. Uh, we can collect GPS. We can uh, collect geographic shapes. So we can have an enumerator actually get on a motorbike, um, ride around, say, a district, and take a GPS point every so often to create an area map of something. 
We can collect photos and videos, uh, dates, and read barcodes. So this all can be combined. It um, can be used on or off a cellular network. And as soon as the phones um, detect that there's either a cellular network or Wi-Fi, it'll automatically transmit all of the information. Um, and it compresses it down to very small um, packages, about um, one kilobyte for everything but the photos and videos. Um, and it separates photos and videos out so that it can transmit over very, very minuscule data connections and cell connections so that we can use it in places um, like remote parts of Africa that have very poor cellular connections and data connections. Uh, on phones, we can do a few other things. We can update information over time. So we can find a data point where we've collected information and then update our, our data. Um, we can view the information on maps. And we can um, take a look at, at our project stats so that people can see what's been done um, on a particular project over a particular portion of time. Just to clarify and emphasize, uh, it can be created your own custom questionnaire and shape or whatever. Right? Yeah, everything's completely customizable um, on any topic. Obviously, Water for People uses it for water and sanitation, um, but it's being used by um, 230 organizations globally for a range of different things. After data is collected, it's immediately transmitted up to back up to the dashboard where we can do a number of things. There's a, a series of data cleaning processes that we can do there, which is not particularly interesting. Um, and we can run a series of reports, create some basic charts and graphs. Um, but basically, people can see their information in near real time. So um, as soon as that information is transmitted, it can be viewed anywhere in the world. Um, we can also send the surveys from anywhere in the world. I can write a survey here in Denver and send it to a phone in Rwanda um, automatically. And then the information is put onto some maps. Um, right now, the maps are pretty basic. Uh, they were kind of initially designed and then redesigned to be simpler, and now are undergoing another redesign. So uh, in April, we're launching a... Um, new version of the maps that will have some ability to do some geospatial analysis and things that it can't do right now. Um, but what the maps do do are show you all the information from the surveys, pictures, um, and where the information comes from. So this is India, and this is a well that was monitored in uh, last year in, in uh, West Bengal in India. So what do we do with this information? So at Water for People, we really use this information to uh, inform all of our programmatic work and to really make differences in the lives of people. So we're a data-driven organization, and we collect about 55,000 data points a year in the places where we work, so an incredible amount of information for a small organization. And we really use it to track our progress towards reaching everybody in the places where we work. Um, and we monitor not just whether people have access to water and sanitation, we monitor a range of uh, indicators to see things like water quality, um, the kinds of quantity people of water people have access to, whether there are seasonal shortages, um, whether people are paying tariffs for their water and whether those tariffs are set at an adequate level to sustain the water systems for the long term. We look at spare parts chains, we look at um, financial uh, indicators to see whether the government is providing adequate resources to the communities for them to be able to provide long-term operation and maintenance. We look at whether there are loans available for people to get access to latrines and other sanitation options. We look at um, schools and clinics and whether they have adequate water and sanitation resources. Um, and we look at uh, whether um, people have the kinds of sanitation options that they want um, and whether those are available in the marketplace. So we really are able to collect lots of different kinds of information, not just is there a well, not just is there a latrine, but we're able to do uh, market analysis, we're able to do um, you know, all kinds of analysis of the entire water and sanitation picture of a whole district so that we can see if people are really being served and if those services are sustainable in the long term. We take that information, we put that into what's a little hard to read here, 
but um, scorecards for all of the 30 districts where we work. Um, so that, and we put this all information all up publicly, including financial information, uh, so that people can see whether we're making progress and whether things are going up or down, and if they're going down, why are they going down, and what we're going to do about it. We also use the information to um, with uh, local government. For us, um, we don't intend to be any place forever. We um, really focus on empowering local and national governments to be the agents of change. Um, so Flow is now the um, planning tool for a number of governments. It's the planning tool for seven municipalities in Bolivia. Um, this is a picture of the mayor of Villa Rivera, one of the municipalities in Bolivia, um, at an annual meeting using data from Flow uh, as a planning tool. And yes, they've made it into a cake, um, the pie charts into a cake. <laughs> Um, because they're kind of fun like that. And then the mayor um, cut out the section which is black, which shows the worst of the worst. And he ate that section and said that he was responsible for eating that section because he was, it was his responsibility to fix it. Um, so that's one way the information is being used. Another way, and I apologize, this is a horrible picture. Another way it's being used is uh, this is a picture of the town square in Tarake where the mayor in Tarake actually put a picture of the map uh, up in the town square on a billboard so that he could prove to the people there that um, they were making progress towards water and sanitation and showing that there were two communities that still did not have improved water systems and that he was making a commitment to reach those two communities with water systems within the next year and that they could hold him accountable for it. Uh, another way we use it is at um, presentations in the sector. So there's an example of the data that we've collected being used at a presentation by um, one of our Ugandan staff at a, uh, before the national government in Uganda. And then another um, map uh, from using the data being used uh, by mayors in the Kiche Department of Guatemala at their annual um, planning process uh, gathered around looking at, at, at the data and looking at what they were going to do to solve the problem areas where there were not adequate water and sanitation. So it's really being used very locally and it's being used in a way that really makes real impact on people's lives. Aside from water for people, flow is being used by a number of other organizations. Uh, it's being used by about 226 organizations globally. Um, and since ACVO took over in 2012, it's been used to collect over a million data points. Slides a little old. I think we're at about 1.5 million data points at this point. And it's being used on uh, over uh, 7,000 Android phones globally. And it's not just being used by us um, in the water and sanitation sector, although that is um, my, part of the Water for People India team uh, in, South, in uh, West Bengal, India. But it's also being used by a number, number of other sectors. It's being used in the healthcare sector in Africa. Uh, there it's being used to track um, patients and patient care for uh, HIV, AIDS, and also um, malaria research. It's being used in conservation uh, by the World Wildlife Federation in uh, Thailand, I believe, uh, to track turtle migration and uh, hatching of sea turtles. And it's being used in the agricultural sector to uh, help people get access to microloans and um, mobile money. So that's my presentation. I went a little quickly through it there, but I wanted to leave lots of time for questions. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just have a quick question about some challenges that you guys might face. So you be successful, but then it's a good use of this. Sure. Absolutely. There's always challenges. We're always looking for what um, what's coming next and what feature development is needed. One of the uh, things that we do have a, a great need for, as you saw, our maps are pretty simple at this point. So one of the features we're really looking forward to is uh, integration with another open source tool called, called CardoDB. 
which is where we're going to get the uh, ability to do some better uh, spatial analysis with, with maps and things. Uh, we do face challenges, even though it's uh, fairly easy to use without access to great internet or great cellular connection. It does require some level of internet connectivity at some point to upload the data. There are places in the world where we still struggle. We work in a district in India called Shiohar that only has electricity about uh, two hours a day. So um, really difficult to get any sort of internet connectivity there and so we do struggle there. In Malawi, in Africa, another place that has really, really poor both cellular um, coverage and internet connectivity and that's a challenge there as well. Um, we thought we would face challenges teaching people how to use the smartphones. It hasn't been a challenge at all. Uh, it has been a challenge kind of restraining people a little bit. They have a tendency to reprogram the phones for all kinds of other things. Um, and so <laughs> that's been an issue. Um, people pick up the phones really, really quickly. Um, uh, we have had some problems with theft and we have had some problems in certain places, particularly where there's been uh, issues with distrust um, of government, um, with communities not trusting people coming in with cell phones to collect information. So particularly in Guatemala, in par parts of Guatemala, that's been a challenge to get people to accept um, technology. Um, We've also faced it in parts of Bolivia. That's been a challenge there as well. So those are some of the things that we've faced. There are about, there's a mile long list of features that we'd like to see. We just had um, 14 of our monitoring staff globally uh, come in last week for a workshop and they met with um, the uh, ACVO team and shared their wish list and it was a very long wish list. So some of the things that they're looking for um, are the ability to triangulate data um, or, or triangulate, triangulate to validate data within a survey. So in other words, if two answers don't match up within a survey, um, they want a warning to pop up and say, hey, that doesn't make sense. You said earlier that, there, that the water system was broken and in this question you said it wasn't broken. What's going on? And so they, they're looking for that sort of validation to happen um, within the survey, we do that kind of validation in post-processing currently, but they'd like it to pop up for the enumerator who's collecting the information. The other big thing is training. Training enumerators is always a struggle whenever you're collecting data. Um, it's training, 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 and it's not training on the phones. People pick that up quickly. It's training on your surveys. It's training on your methodology, um, and your data is only as good as your training is. Um, we have a uh, monitoring uh, field, one of our monitoring field staff, Muti uh, Hema from Malawi, wrote a really great piece for us on training good enumerators and paying for really good data, um, where he said, you know, one of the, he had a great quote that um, he pays for quality data. He doesn't pay by the survey or by the day. He pays per quality survey, so he actually checks every survey to make sure that they're, um, it's high quality. And uh, he says it's expensive to do it that way in both times and money, in, cost, in terms of both time and money. But uh, he had a quote that the only thing more expensive than good data is bad data. Um, so <laughs> it's one of those things that's really true because we do make a lot of decisions based on on the data that we're collecting. <laughs> Good. Are you uh, focused on training your um, members or It varies from place to place. Um, in some places we work where we work really closely with the governments and where communities tend to be fairly small, um, particularly in Latin America, um, it's oftentimes health workers that work for the government um, or other government officials that are collecting the data. Um, in Africa and India, uh, the places where we work are huge. There might be 2,500 communities in a district and it's just not possible to, do, to use government workers to do that. So in those cases, we're hiring enumerators. Um, 
and we've got kind of cores of enumerators in those places that we've used now for several years in a row. There's some turnover, obviously, but we try to use the same people over and over again um, that, that collect our data for us. They're typically teachers in their off season or college students who are the ones that are collecting the data. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have two questions. You mentioned before that people reprogram the phones, and I'm curious. Well, I mean, a lot of it's just putting a bunch of junk on there that slows them down. So oh. they'll, uh, you know, fill it up with YouTube and Facebook and all kinds of other things. But they do sometimes manage to pull the whole application off the phone or get into kind of the guts of the phone and delete essential um, pieces of. The phone's core programming I've, and so we've had to like completely factory reset which doesn't sound like a big deal it's easy enough for you and I to do it's really difficult when they're out in the middle of nowhere in Rwanda um, and there's essentially no connectivity to try to figure out how to get the connectivity to do that so yeah, the thing I was curious about is do you have places where the responsible parties know there's a problem and they really don't want anybody collecting data to show that there's a problem. Because as long as there's no data, there's no problem. People think so, you had trouble? Yeah, with? there's that's not so much the problem. Where there really is a need, people want the information collected because they want a solution. And people really want solutions to their water and sanitation problems. Um, the harder part is when we start to reach full coverage or we start to get too close to having a problem solved. So there are a couple of places where we work, um, small regions in Honduras and Bolivia, where we've gotten to the point where we have working really high quality water systems in all the communities. We get to that point, the government sometimes doesn't want to collect accurate information because they're afraid of losing the donor dollars. And so they're afraid that if they say everything's good, then we'll step back and then they won't have that money coming into their districts anymore. And so in those cases, we've had to look at um, how can we help them build business in their community, um, build business opportunities and other things like that so that they have uh, what they need within their community without having to have donor dollars come. So we've had that that happen in a different way. So, so I want to know a little bit more about the, the, the platform. Sure. Um, do they, a couple of questions regarding data, you know, does, does Adlo store all of the data? Or do you, or when you download from GitHub, like is there a server that you have to find yourself? So currently it's, you yeah. That, yeah, go ahead. Sure, he was just asking where the data is stored. Where, where does all the data go? Um, it's currently stored in Google App Engine, which um, when we started out was a very inexpensive place to store data. And so it is all stored within the system itself and it is maintained by ACVO. Um, but, uh, and when we started out, Google App Engine was a very inexpensive way for us to store information. It's gotten very expensive lately. And so we're looking for a new home for for where, where ACFO is looking for a new home for where they're going to store the data. So they're looking into some other options right now um, into open source data storage. And in that case, is the data open? You mentioned governments can use it but not edit it. Can we just download it? Like so there's there's a couple of different levels. It's up to the organizations. So ACFO's preference would be for all data to be open. There are some organizations that collect sensitive information. Health organizations particularly can't actually open all of their data because there's private information. We collect some private information at our organization. So they have different settings for their data. You can set it as either public or private. Um, public data goes into public facing maps and into data that's accessible. Um, at the moment, you can get it through an API. Um, private data, you have to get permission for from the organization themselves, uh, and the different organizations have different rules on whether they'll you know, share their data or not. It's ultimately up to the organizations who are using the system what they make public and private. So the, the, again, just to, to, to the, the flow helps you connect the data, you can 
formerly questionnaires. And then after the three days of double that point was asking to load into that server and claim. And then after that point, is there other parts of flow like process the thing, the statistics and stuff? There's some very basic statistics right now. So right now we have some reports that do some just very basic descriptive statistics, make some basic charts and graphs like this. Um, and uh, we can, that's kind of the limitations to the reporting at the moment. Um, that's one of the features that's coming online in April along with the map um, improvements is some reporting improvements. Um, so they're, they're building out the analytical components. Right now, the analytical, the analysis that's done at Water for People is done manually by me. <laughs> so. And this analysis will be all, also generic uh, time, right? So it's, it's basic stats. Like right now it's very basic. The idea is to build some very customizable, um, flexible reporting uh, queries so that people can pull exactly what they want to pull. So if you're enumerators in the field, um, their devices, is it like real time sent or is it collected, archived, and then transferred? It, dep the it depends. Oh, yeah. He just wanted to know if the uh, data is sent real time or if it's uh, collected and archived. And so the answer is it depends. If there's any sort of um, cell connection or Wi Fi connection on the phone, it's automatically sent. Um, as soon as the enumerator hits the submit button. If there's no cellular connection or Wi-Fi connection, then it's um, what's called stored, we call stored and forwarded. It's stored on the phone. We can store up to about a thousand surveys per um, phone before it has to be uploaded. Um, but it's stored until the phone detects a Wi-Fi or cellular signal. As soon as it, connect, it detects that, it automatically sends it up. The enumerator doesn't have to do anything. In the cases where there really is no connectivity, there are some other ways of getting the information off the phone. So you can actually pull it off manually onto a computer um, that has a hard line and then transmit it through a bulk um, manual upload as well. I don't know if this is too well, with field work, I mean, I work with amazing people all around the world. Um, our field staff, uh, the field staff in country are all local. Uh, we don't have any Americans based in the field. Um, so we're working with amazing, amazing professionals from the countries where we work. And that's absolutely the most rewarding part of my job is I get to travel, I get to go into the field, I get to go into communities, I get to interact with people. Um, and then from you know, the, the tech side of it and, and, and the, the collecting information, I love that it's something that people can use really quickly. I love that our field staff can make real time decisions off of it and that it's influencing the work that they do. Um, and it's kind of my baby. I'm like, I'm the only one who's seen flow through from day one till now. Um, I'm the only person still on the project that was on it from day one. So it's kind of my, my baby to watch this thing grow and, and see it spread from one organization to, you know, a whole bunch globally. So that's been really rewarding for me. Um, going along with that, I was just wondering if you have a GIS staff. We don't. Yeah, we have no GIS staff. Um, we have uh, uh, several of our global staff are engineers, and so they use um, various components of GIS. They use um, some of them use, uh, we have some donated versions of, of Bentley uh, maps and uh, uh, MicroStation, so they use it as part of their jobs. Um, I, dabble a little bit, though I'm not by any means a uh, professional, and um, we have some volunteers that help us out from time to time as well. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, so what happens if one of the water systems is you know, a complicated part? Um, how does that happen sure. in the field, and then do you have to go back and yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is what happens when something goes wrong with a, a water system um, and it needs to be repaired and then do we have to go back and update the data? Um, the answer is that we uh, as an organization don't employ any 
um, technologies that are not locally available, so in terms of water systems. And part of uh, what we do, we actually don't do any um, building of water systems ourselves. We bring all the stakeholders together so that they can build the systems. So part of that is making sure there's a spare parts chain and making sure the spare parts are locally available and making sure there are plumbers um, available in the community that know how to fix the systems and making sure all of that's in place and making sure people are paying tariffs so that there's money to fix the system and making sure that um, when it needs to be ultimately replaced, there's money in the bank to replace the whole system. So that's what we do. Um, our job is not to put in hardware. Our job is to make sure all of the software components are in place so that when things break they can be fixed and then the answer is yes we absolutely have to be constantly updating our information so we have a global process by which we update our information annually um, that's kind of our core information that's required you must update it all annually which isn't doesn't sound like very often but when you're working as broadly as we are it's a lot um, and then in addition to that our local staff are doing much more frequent um, updates uh, of um, their own particular uh, surveys that they're creating. This one that I put up here was from a you know functionality report log that they were doing in Malawi where they were tracking literally the breakdowns of uh, every um, every well in a particular district and so you could see exactly what was breaking and why and where they were getting the spare parts to fix it. Go ahead. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, how much how much responsibility do you have as far as water systems? How do you share that with the local government? So it's. Um, that's a great question. The question was how much of the responsibility is the local communities to manage a water system and how much is the local governments? It works kind of like it does here, or our model is for it to work kind of like it does here. Government is ultimately responsible for regulation. It's ultimately responsible for um, policy. It's ultimately responsible for water quality. And ultimately it's responsible for the major uh, infrastructure. Um, communities are responsible for all of the basic operation and maintenance. Um, in some cases, they are responsible for the entire water system if that is a hand pump, which is a pretty simple unit. Um, but local communities are ultimately responsible for collecting tariffs, um, doing the operation and maintenance, and making sure that the everything's functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Government is, is responsible for making sure the whole system is functioning in all of the communities. So it's kind of, we try to have the same model. The idea is if it works here, it'll probably work other places too. So we're trying to kind of use a, a similar model to what works in the U.S. So um, getting a bit more with the data, so yeah. just thinking of phones that don't have, um, they're not within a signal range. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've all experienced, you know, that, 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 something like that, you guess accuracy is uh, so so. Do you have any, um, have you had any problems, you know, maybe not so much water, but I can see like the animal conservation and monitoring, you know, they need some more precise mm -hmm. measurements. Do you, you have anything? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, so the question is about the, the GPS accuracy when there's no, no uh, cell signal. Um, we don't face too much of a problem in our organization. We do have a process where we require people to calibrate their GPS units every day and any time that they've moved their, their phones more than uh, 400 meters. That's just our internal protocol to keep things accurate. Um, and we ask people to check on a daily basis that they've got their um, accuracy down to a margin of error of less than five meters. For us, that's good enough. Um, I think that's probably good enough for most people. We do have things happen where people don't follow that and we do end up with water points sitting out in the middle of oceans and so then we have to go back and you know fix it. Nothing's perfect. So I'm very about people in the many different fields of application that are after these kinds of functionality. And so how how do you promote? I mean I know you've done your job but how do you expose the flow to other people? Because like, I'm not part of it, and I can tell you a long list of people are after me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we don't do a lot of promoting as 
in terms of water for people other than um, we talk to other people in the sector all the time. Uh, it's really a tool for the development sector and so we haven't really worried about kind of moving beyond that. Um, it kind of travels through word of mouth, I think. Um, I, ACVO as an organization has gotten to the point where they've been, become inundated with requests for it to the point where it's almost more than they can handle. Um, so they aren't actually actively marketing it either because they're trying to stay afloat. Um, but it's it's out there and, and um, it, it's, it's just kind of spread through word of mouth. And that's one of the issues in general, for I mean, for in general, the enterprise and stuff like that, the marketing budgets and the company making the, you know, available yeah. and the information, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that water for people essentially says with this open source software, as the organization moves towards embracing policy uh, regimes, are there aspects of the organization? Um, we, we're thinking about it. Uh, we've, we've created another platform called the Reimagined Reporting Platform, which we said, well, we've got all of this data, now what? Um, like a lot of organizations do. And so we've started building another platform to take data once you have it and present it in a really simple, easy to use dashboard that can integrate data from programmatic data, um, financial data, and uh, other kinds of information, and we started building that, and now we're starting to look at, again, we're, we're finding ourselves in that same place of more interest in it than we thought there would be, and um, how do we take it in and make it available to the sector? So we're starting to look at, um, is it time to open source that, or do we need to develop it a little further first? And, and so we probably will end up back down that same path at some point in the future. Um, we kind of are an organization where we just build and run and go, um, and then figure it out as we're running along the path. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've relied on, um, oh, sorry, yeah. So is there a need for GIS professionals in the nonprofit sector? And yeah, absolutely, and I think we're seeing more and more um, more and more organizations using either volunteers um, or starting to make room within their um, their research units as organizations actually start to embrace nonprofits start to embrace um, research in general I think you'll start to see more and more professionals come into the space I think for a long time it was hard to get donors to accept that research was an important part of what we do there's always kind of a drive to, I want to give the money to actually building the well or doing the, the work, um, whereas you can't know what the right work to do is unless you actually have a strong research component. And that's all starting to shift um, big funding organizations like Gates, um, like the Hilton organizations, like these, these big funders are starting to shift and really embrace research. And as they do that, I do think there's more and more room for, for GIS professionals. Um, we have a, um, we ha how do we get volunteers? Uh, with Water for People, we have a program called the World Water Corps, um, where professionals can apply to, you know, volunteer their skills. Um, it used to be, like I've said, it used to be a field-based um, organization where we'd send volunteers to collect data. We realized that was really not the best use of their skills, and so now it's mostly desk-based, where we'll say, um, we'll look at our, our um, kind of database of volunteers and say, okay, we're doing a um, hydro, anal hydro geological analysis of a district. We are going to need an um, engineer, and we're going to need a GIS professional. We're going to need a water quality person, and then we'll search our database for people who fit those skills and bring them together to do a desk study. So, so yeah, you can go to waterforpeople.org and World Water Corps and, and – um, Upload your resume if you're interested. Are there any other questions other or questions? comments? Yeah. Perfect. A lot of great questions, and 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 uh, thank you so much. It was very exciting. I just
our, our previous guests in this series will be jumping up and down when they see this as part of what they want now and for, for their work for collection for floods and emergencies. So thank you so much. Thank you. And um, again, to everyone, the recording will be posted again on the website in a couple of weeks so you can access it and you can pass the word around it. Uh, thanks so much for being here and we'll see you in the next meeting. Thank you.